Senjo Washing by A. A. Dogen From Shobo Genzo The Treasury of the True Dharma Eye There is practice and experience the Buddhist patriarchs have guarded and maintained. It is called not being tainted. The sixth patriarch asks Zen Master Daye of Kanonin Temple on Nangaku Zan Mountain. Do you rely on practice and experience or not? Daye says, it is not that there is no practice and experience, but the state can never be tainted. The sixth patriarch says, just this untainted state is that which Buddhas guard and desire. You are also like this. I am also like this. And the ancestral masters of India were also like this. The Sutra of 3,000 dignified forms for ordained monks says, Purifying the body means washing the anus and the urethra and cutting the nails of the ten fingers. So, even though the body and mind is not tainted, there are Dharma practices of purifying the body. And there are Dharma practices of purifying the mind. Not only do we clean body and mind. We also clean the national land and clean beneath trees. To clean the national land, even though it has never become dirty, is that which Buddhas guard and desire. And even when they have arrived at the Buddhist effect. They still do not draw back or cease. It is hard to fathom this point. To enact the Dharma is the point. To attain the state of truth is to enact the Dharma. The Pure Conduct chapter of the Garland Sutra says, quote, When we relieve ourselves, we should pray that living beings will get rid of impurity and will be free of greed, anger and delusion. Then, having arrived at the water, we should pray that living beings will progress towards the supreme state of truth and attain the Dharma, which transcends the secular world. While we are washing away impurity with the water, we should pray that living beings will have pure endurance and will ultimately be free of dirt. End quote. Water is not always originally pure or originally impure. The body is not always originally pure or originally impure. All dharmas are like this. Water 
is never sentient or non-sentient. The body is never sentient or non-sentient. And all dharmas are like this. The preaching of the Buddha, the world-honoured one, is like this. At the same time, to wash is not to use water to clean the body. Rather, when we are maintaining and relying upon the Buddha Dharma, in accordance with the Buddha Dharma. We have this form of behavior and we call it washing. It is to receive the authentic transmission of a body and mind of the Buddhist patriarch immediately. It is to see and hear a phrase of the Buddhist patriarch immediately. And it is to abide in and to retain a state of brightness of the Buddhist patriarch clearly. In sum, it is to realize countless and limitless virtues. At just the moment, when we dignify body and mind with training, eternal original practice is completely and roundly realized. Thus the body and mind of training manifests itself in the original state. We should cut the nails of all ten fingers. Of all ten fingers means the fingernails of both left and right hand. We should also cut the toenails. The sutra says, quote, if the nails grow to the length of a grain of wheat, we acquire demerit. End quote. So, we should not let the nails grow long. Long nails are naturally a precursor of non-Buddhism. We should make a point of cutting the nails. Nevertheless, among the priests of the great kingdom of Sung today, many who are not equipped with eyes of learning in practice grow their nails long. Some have nails one or two inches long, and even three or four inches long. This goes against the Dharma. It is not the body and mind of the Buddha Dharma. People are like this because they are without reverence for the old traditions of Buddhists. Venerable patriarchs who possess the state of truth are never like this. There are others who grow their hair long this also goes against the Dharma. Do not mistakenly suppose that because these are the habits of priests in a great nation, they might be right Dharma. My late master, the Eternal Buddha, spoke stern words of warning to priests throughout the country who had long hair or long nails. He said, quote, Those who do not understand the importance of shaving the head are not secular people, 
and are not monks. They are just animals. Since ancient times, was there any Buddhist patriarch who did not shave the head? Those today who do not understand the importance of shaving the head are truly animals. End quote. When he preached the assembly like this, many people who had not shaved their heads for years shaved their heads. In formal preaching in the Dharma Hall, or in his informal preaching, the master would click his fingers loudly as he scolded them. Quote, not knowing what the truth is, they randomly grow long hair and long nails. It is pitiful that they devote a body and mind in the south continent of Jambud Vipa to wrong ways. For the last two or three hundred years, because the truth of the ancestral master has died out, there have been many people like these. People like these become the leaders of temples and signing their names with the title of master. They create the appearance of acting for the sake of the many. But they are without benefit to human beings and gods. Nowadays, on all the mountains throughout the country, there is no one at all who has the will to the truth. The ones who attain the truth are long extinct. Only groups of the corrupt and the degenerate remain. End quote. When he spoke like this in his informal preaching, people from many districts who had arbitrarily assumed the title of veteran master bore no grudge against him and had nothing to say for themselves. Remember, growing the hair long is something that Buddhist patriarchs remonstrate against. And growing the nails long is something that non-Buddhists do. As the children and grandchildren of Buddhist patriarchs, we should not be fond of such violations of the Dharma. We should clean the body and mind, and we should cut the nails and shave the head. Wash the anus and the urethra. Do not neglect this. There was an episode in which, through this practice, Shariputra caused a non-Buddhist to submit himself. This was neither the original expectation of the non-Buddhist, nor the premeditated hope of Shariputra. But when the dignified behaviour of the Buddhist patriarchs is realised, false teaching naturally succumbs. When monks practice beneath a tree or on open ground, they have no constructed toilets. They rely on conveniently located river valleys, streams and so on, and they clean themselves with pieces of soil. 
this is when there is no ash. They just use two lots of seven balls of soil. The method of using the two lots of seven balls of soil is as follows. First, they take off the Dharma robe and fold it. Then, they pick up some soil, not black, but yellowish soil, and divide it into balls, each about the size of a large soybean. They arrange these into rows of seven balls on a stone or some other convenient place, making two rows of seven balls each. After that, they prepare a stone to be used as a rub stone. And after that, they defecate. After defecating, they use a stick or sometimes they use paper. Then they go to the water side to clean themselves, first carrying three balls of soil to clean with. They take each individual ball of soil in the palm of the hand and add just a little water so that when mixed with the water the soil dissolves to a consistency thinner than mud, about the consistency of thin rice gruel. They wash the urethra first. Next they use one ball of soil in the same way as before to wash the anus. And next they use one ball of soil in the same way as before briefly to wash the impure hand. Ever since monks started living in temples, they have built toilet buildings. These are called Tosu, the East Office, or sometimes Se, the toilet, and sometimes Shi, the side building. They are buildings which should be present wherever monks are living. The rule in going to the toilet is always to take the long towel. The method is to fold the towel in two and then place it over the left elbow so that it hangs down from above the sleeve of your jacket. Having arrived at the toilet, hang the towel over the clothes pole. The way to hang it is as it has been hanging from your arm. If you have come wearing a kashaya of nine stripes, seven stripes, and so on, hang the kashaya along the towel. Arrange the kashaya evenly so that it will not fall down. Do not throw it over the pole hastily. Be careful to remember the mark on the pole. Remembering the mark refers to the characters written along the clothes pole. These are written inside moon shaped circles on sheets of white paper, which are then attached in a line along the pole. So remembering the mark means not forgetting by which character you have put your own gown and not getting the places mixed up. When many monks are present, do not confuse your own place on the pole with that of others. During this time, when other monks have arrived and are standing in lines, bow to them with the hands folded. 
In bowing, it is not necessary to face each other directly and bend the body. It is just a token bow of salutation, with the folded hands placed in front of the chest. At the toilet, even if you are not wearing a gown, still bow to and salute other monks. If neither hand has become impure, and neither hand is holding anything, fold both hands and bow. If one hand is already soiled, or when one hand is holding something, make the bow with the other hand. To make the bow with one hand, turn the hand palm upward, curl the fingertips slightly as if preparing to scoop up water, and bow as if just lowering the head slightly. If someone else bows like this, you should do likewise. When you take off the jacket and the gown, hang them next to the towel. The way to hang them is as follows. Remove the gown and bring the sleeves together at the back. Then bring together the armpits and lift them up so that the sleeves are one over the other. Then take the inside of the back of the collar of the gown with the left hand, pull up the shoulders with the right hand, and fold the sleeves and the left and right lapels over each other. Having folded the sleeves, and lapels over each other, make another fold down the middle from top to bottom, and then throw the collar of the gown over the top of the pole. The hem of the gown and the ends of the sleeves will be hanging on the near side of the pole. For example, the gown will be hanging from the pole by the join at the waist. Next, cross over the ends of the towel which are hanging down on the near and far sides of the pole and pull them across to the other side of the gown. There, on the side of the gown, where the towel is not hanging, cross over the ends again and make a knot. Go round two or three times, crossing over the ends and making a knot, to ensure that the gown does not fall from the pole to the ground. Facing the gown, join the palms of your hands. Next, take the cord and use it to tuck in the sleeves. Next, go to the washstand and fill a bucket with water. And then, holding the bucket in the right hand, walk up to the toilet. The way to put water in the bucket is not to fill it completely, but to make 90% the standard. In front of the toilet entrance, change slippers. Changing slippers means taking off your own slippers in front of the toilet entrance and putting on the straw toilet slippers. Zen En Shingi says, quote, 
When we want to go to the toilet, we should go there ahead of time. Do not get into a state of anxiety and haste by arriving just in time. At this time, fold the kashaya and place it on the desk in your quarters or over the clothes pole. End quote. Having entered the toilet, close the door with the left hand. Next, pour just a little water from the bucket into the bowl of the toilet. Then put the bucket in its place directly in front of the hole. Then, while standing facing the toilet bowl, click the fingers three times. When clicking the fingers, make a fist with the left hand and hold it against the left hip. Then put the hem of your skirt and the edges of your clothes in order. Face the entrance. Position the feet either side of the rim of the toilet bowl. Squat down and defecate. Do not get either side of the bowl dirty and do not soil the front or the back of the bowl. During this time, keep quiet. Do not chat or joke with the person on the other side of the wall and do not sing songs or recite verses in a loud voice. Do not make a mess by weeping and dribbling and do not be angry or hasty. Do not write characters on the walls and do not draw lines in the earth with the shit stick. The stick is to be used after you have relieved yourself. Another way is to use paper. Old paper should not be used, and paper with characters written upon it should not be used. Distinguish between clean sticks and dirty sticks. The sticks are eight sun long, of triangular section and the thickness of a thumb. Some are lacquered, some are not lacquered. Dirty sticks are thrown into the stick box. Clean sticks originally belong in the stick rack. The stick rack is placed near the board that screens the front of the toilet bowl. After using the stick or using paper, the method of washing is as follows. Holding the bucket in the right hand, Dip the left hand well into the water and then, making the left hand into a dipper, scoop up the water, first rinsing the urethra three times and then washing the anus. Make yourself pure and clean by washing according to the method. During this time, do not tip the bucket so suddenly that water spills out of the hand or splashes down, causing the water to be used up quickly. After you have finished washing, put the bucket in its place and then, taking another stick, wipe yourself dry. Or you can use paper. Both places, the urethra and the anus, should be thoroughly wiped dry. 
Next, with the right hand, rearrange the hem of your skirt and the corners of your clothes. And holding the bucket in the right hand, leave the toilet. Taking off the straw toilet slippers and putting on your own slippers as you pass through the entrance. Next, returning to the washstand, put the bucket back in its original place. Then wash the hands. Taking the spoon for ash in the right hand. First, scoop some ash onto a tile or a stone. Sprinkle a few drops of water on it with the right hand and cleanse the soiled hand. Scrub the fingers on the tile or the stone as if sharpening a rusty sword on a whetstone. Wash like this using ash three times. Then wash another three times, putting soil on the stone and sprinkling it with water. Next, take a honey locust in the right hand. Dip it in a small tub of water and scrub it between the hands. Wash the hands thoroughly, going up to the forearms as well. Wash with care and effort, dwelling in the mind of sincerity. Three lots of ash, three lots of soil, and one honey locust make seven rounds altogether. That is the standard. Next, wash the hands in the large tub. This time, skin cleansers, soil, ash, and so on, are not used. Just wash with water, either hot or cold. After washing once, pour the used water into a small bucket. Then pour some fresh water into the tub and wash the hands again. The Garland Sutra says, quote, When we wash the hands with water, we should pray that living beings will get excellent and fine hands with which to receive and to retain the Buddha Dharma. End quote. To pick up the water ladle, always use your right hand. While doing this, do not noisily clatter ladle and bucket. Do not splash water about. Scatter honey locusts around. Get the washstand area wet. Or be generally hasty and messy. Next, wipe the hands on the common towel or wipe them on your own towel. After wiping the hands, go under the clothes pole in front of your gown and take off the cord and hang it on the pole. Next, after joining hands, untie the towel Take down the gown and put it on. Then, with the towel hanging over the left arm, apply fragrance. In the common area, there is a fragrance applier. It is a fragrant wood fashioned into the shape of a treasure pot, as thick as a thumb and as long as the width of four fingers. It is hung from the clothes pole with a piece of string 
a foot or more long, which is threaded through a hole bored in each end of the fragrant wood. When this is rubbed between the palms, it naturally spreads its scent to the hands. When you hang your cord on the pole, do not hang it on top of another, so that cord and cord become confused and entangled. Actions like these all purify the Buddha's land and adorn the Buddha's kingdom. So do them carefully and do not be hasty. Do not be in a hurry to finish, thinking that you would like to get back. Privately, you might like to consider the principle that we do not explain the Buddha Dharma while in the toilet. Do not keep looking into the faces of other monks who have come there. Cold water is considered better for washing when in the toilet itself. It is said that hot water gives rise to intestinal diseases. But there is no restriction against using warm water to wash the hands. The reason that a cauldron is provided is so that we can boil water for washing the hands. Shingi says, quote, Late in the evening, boil water and supply oil. Always ensure a continuous supply of hot and cold water so that the minds of the monks are not disturbed. End quote. So we see that we can use both hot and cold water. If the inside of the toilet has become dirty, close the door and hang up the dirty sign. If a bucket has been dropped into the toilet bowl by mistake, close the door and hang up the fallen bucket sign. Do not enter a closet on which one of these signs is hung. If, when you are ready in the toilet, you hear someone outside clicking the fingers, you should leave presently. Shingi says, quote, Without washing, we must neither sit on the monk's platform nor bow to the three treasures. Neither must we receive people's prostrations. End quote. The Sutra of 3000 Dignified Forms says, Quote, if we fail to wash the anus and the urethra, we commit a duskurta, and we must not sit on a monk's pure sitting cloth or bow to the three treasures. Even if we do bow, there is no happiness or virtue. End quote. Thus, at a place of the truth where we strive in pursuit of the truth, we should consider this behaviour to be foremost. How could we not bow to the three treasures? How could we not receive people's prostrations? And how could we not bow to others? In the place of truth of a Buddhist patriarch, this dignified behaviour is always done. And people in the place of truth of a Buddhist patriarch are always equipped with this dignified behaviour.
It is not our own intentional effort. It is the natural expression of dignified behaviour itself. It is the usual behaviour of the Buddhas and the everyday life of the patriarchs. It is Buddha behaviour, not only of Buddhas in this world. It is Buddha behaviour throughout the Ten Directions. It is Buddha behaviour in the Pure Land and in impure lands. People of scant knowledge do not think that Buddhas have dignified behaviour in the toilet, and they do not think that the dignified behaviour of Buddhas in the Saha world is like that of Buddhas in the Pure Land. This is not learning of the Buddha's truth. Remember, purity and impurity is exemplified by blood dripping from a human being. At one time it is warm, at another time it is disgusting. The Buddhas have toilets, and this we should remember. Fascicle 14 of Precepts in Ten Parts says, quote, Shramanara Rahula spent the night in the Buddha's toilet. When the Buddha woke up, the Buddha patted Rahula on the head with his right hand and preached the following verse. You were never stricken by poverty, nor have you lost wealth and nobility. Only in order to pursue the truth you have left home, you will be able to endure the hardship. End quote. Thus, there are toilet buildings in the Buddha's places of practising the truth. And the dignified behaviour done in the Buddha's toilet building is washing. That the Buddha behaviour, having been transmitted from patriarch to patriarch, still survives, is a delight to those who venerate the ancients. We have been able to meet what is difficult to meet. Furthermore, the Tathagata graciously preached the Dharma for Rahula inside the toilet building. The toilet building was one place of assembly for the Buddha's turning of the Dharma wheel. The advancing and stillness of that place of truth has been authentically transmitted by the Buddhist patriarchs. Fascicle 34 of the Mahasamgika precept says, the toilet building should not be located to the east or to the north. It should be located to the south or to the west. The same applies to the urinal. We should follow this designation of the favourable directions. This was the layout of all the monasteries in India in the western heavens and the method of construction in the Tathagata's lifetime. Remember, this is not only the Buddha form followed by one Buddha. It describes the places of truth, the monasteries of the seven Buddhas. It was never initiated. It is the dignified form of the Buddhas.
before we have clarified these dignified forms. If we hope to establish a temple and to practice the Buddha Dharma, we will make many mistakes. We will not be equipped with the Buddha's dignified forms, and the Buddha's state of Bodhi will not yet manifest itself before us. If we hope to build a place of practicing the truth, or to establish a temple, we should follow the Dharma form which the Buddhist patriarchs have authentically transmitted. We should just follow the Dharma form which has been authentically transmitted as the right tradition. Because it is the traditional authentic transmission, its virtue has accumulated again and again. Those who are not legitimate successors to the authentic transmission of the Buddhist patriarchs do not know the body and mind of the Buddha Dharma. Without knowing the body and mind of the Buddha Dharma, they never clarify the Buddha actions of the Buddha's lineage. That the Buddha Dharma of the great master Shakyamuni Buddha has now spread widely through the ten directions is the realization of the Buddha's body and mind. The realization of the Buddha's body and mind just in the moment is like this. Preached to the assembly at Kanandori Kosho Horinji Temple in the Uji district of Yoshu on the 23rd day of the 10th lunar month in the winter of the first year of Eno. <laughs> 